Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Hey church family, good morning, Pastor Jason here. I've been praying for you all week long because I believe God wants to do something special in our hearts and lives as we spend time in his word today. I also wanna say happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We hope you're having an incredible day celebrating. Maybe you're watching and Father's Day isn't a happy day for you. Listen, I want you to understand that we see you and we love you and we are praying for you as well. I want to remind you that next Sunday is Child Dedication Sunday at church at both of our campuses. And so if you have a newborn, if you have a, a toddler, an elementary age child, and you just want to commit them to the Lord, you want our church family to pray over them, you can go to our website and you can click on the events tab, click on child dedication, and you can register your child there. It would be our honor and our privilege to pray with you for your children. Hey, if this is your first time with us, welcome. We are so thankful that you've chose to worship with us this morning. We are in a series called 52. We are actually reading through the Bible chronologically together as a church family. And we're taking the 52 Sundays of the year to look at major Bible stories and see how they apply to our lives. It's not about Bible knowledge. It's about wisdom. It's about applying God's word to our each and every day because God's word makes a difference in us. And if you've noticed as we've gone through this uh, season of the, the kings and moving into the prophets in just a couple of weeks, you know that King David's life was full of ups and downs, right? And sometimes we see a man after God's own heart, and sometimes we see a man who is very distant from God. And as we move into God's word and dig into God's word this morning, let's pray together and then open up the scriptures. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for your power and presence in our homes and hospital rooms and hotel rooms. God, wherever people are watching from today, God, I pray that you would speak directly to them, minister to their hearts and lives. Father, may the words that come from my lips come directly from your heart today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was studying this week, I came across a story of a little boy who greatly missed his dad. His dad was separated from their family for a long time because of military duty. But his son was comforted by a picture of the dad that sat by his bed. And whenever he would get frightened, he would look at that picture on the nightstand and he would imagine his father watching over him. But one night as he went to bed, he got scared and it just didn't work. He wasn't comforted. And his mom, hearing him weeping, came into the room and said, son, what's wrong? And through tears, he said, I want daddy to come out of that frame. Have you ever had that experience? You know that your heavenly father is real. You know that he is good. You know that he loves you. Yet are there times where God feels like he's in a frame. It feels like he doesn't hear your call or see your need or even feel your pain. God seems far away. Today, what I feel like God would have us to do is walk through one of David's Psalms, Psalm 13. And my prayer is that by the end of this message, the end of this time together this morning, you'll leave understanding what to do when you feel distant from God. Because if you've never felt that way, there's probably going to be a time in your life when you do. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, it's okay. The verses are going to be on the screen. Psalm 13, starting in verse 1. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? You see, God had promised David the throne of Israel when he was young. But that coronation day seemed to get further and further away. King Saul was doing evil things and God was not judging him. David, on the other hand, was doing what was good, yet he felt abandoned by God. And David was concerned about what his enemies were doing. 
but he was even more concerned about what it seemed like God was not doing. And he asked the question, how long, four times in these two verses? How long is a familiar question in Scripture? And it is a perfectly good question if your heart is right with God. You see, the book of Revelation teaches us that even the saints in heaven ask the question, God, how long, how long before you're going to do something? And in these verses, we see, we understand, we feel how David was feeling. It is real and it is raw and it is genuine and it is authentic. If you're taking notes, we see that David, he feels abandoned. He feels abandoned. We are left with the understanding that whatever David is crying out to God about has been going on for a very long time. The length of David's suffering has been so long that David asks if God is going to forget him forever. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I've been in times of deep despair when it seems difficult to even remember when better times existed in my life. Have you ever been there? The feelings of loss and abandonment are so great that we're just unable to see when the end will come. It is important that we recognize, friend, that this is the very nature of trials. Very rarely are we able to see when the trial will end. Even worse, we are unable to see what the final outcome will be from the trial. This is the type of emotion upon which David expresses these words. When we consider the life of David being a man after God's own heart, it's easy for us to only remember the positive things that happen in David's life. Yet we cannot forget the suffering and the trials and the trauma that David endured. He lost a son because of his sins. He was chased for his life by Saul and by his own son, Absalom. Not all times were good times in the life of David. He felt abandoned. He believes, number two, that God's blessings have vanished. He goes further and says, God, how long will you hide your face from me? This is an expression used in the scriptures to speak about the blessings of God. God seemed so far removed from David. David felt like God was no longer blessing him. That protection, that refuge, that safety of the Lord seems to have been taken away. This expression also communicates being in good graces. To be facing someone shows love and favor, while hiding the face indicates a turned back, implying rejection. This is a common feeling that most of us will experience in our life when things go wrong or trouble comes. Many times we say these very words, God, where are you? We also see that David, he was lost in his emotions. Not only is he dealing with the feeling of abandonment toward God, but he is wrestling with his own flood of emotions. David says that he wrestles with his thoughts and has sorrows in his heart every day. He simply describes the depths of his despair. And he declares to the Lord that his emotions are eating him up inside. He is fighting the negative thoughts in his own mind. How many times, friends, must we wrestle with our emotions when we're suffering, when we're in the middle of a storm, when we're in the midst of a trial? Our minds may tell us to give up, to give in, and tell us things that just aren't true. We also see that David said that his enemies are winning. His enemies are winning. David asked the Lord, how long will my enemies triumph over me? It seems that when things are going bad, there are always plenty of other people to pile on pain, right? It always seems like there are people ready just to kick you when you're down. And David expresses that feeling as his enemies continue to rule over him and triumph over him. And I believe we can relate to that feeling also. We can feel that just as when we think we're about to get up, when we're about to gain ground, another enemy comes along and puts us 
back down. It looks like David's life is closing in on him. It feels like God has left him. And so the question is, what does he do and what do we do when we face these same moments of despair? Let's continue in verses 3 and 4. David says, turn and answer me. Oh, Lord, my God, restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. Uh, Listen, the first thing that David does is he turns to God in prayer. I know what you're thinking. Uh, This is such a pastoral message, Jason. You're talking about prayer. We know that we should pray. But listen, friends, what I have found in almost 15 years of full-time ministry, even though we know we should pray, we rarely pray like we should. And for many of us, we feel like we don't even know how to pray, even if we've been believers for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. And what we see here in this psalm is a petition to God about what he is enduring. And we've made mention of this before time and time again. But friends, when we're faced with a situation, the first thing we do is pray. No matter what comes up against us, no matter what happens, the first thing that we must do is pray. And what I love about this prayer is that There are four elements that we can incorporate. We can actually use this as a model in our prayer time with God when we are facing despair, when we're facing impossible situations and circumstances. So again, if you're taking notes, the first thing you can do is this. The first element to this prayer that David prays is ask God to turn toward you. Ask God to turn toward you. In verse 3, David says, look on me. Literally, David is asking God to turn his face, to see what is happening, to give David regard and consideration. It's strange to me that often the last thing we do when we feel abandoned by God is pray, is to try to talk to him. Many times when we're in a sorrowful situation, we throw a pity party. We bemoan that we feel like God has turned his back on us. Yet that's not what we're supposed to do. David tells God that he feels this way. And instead of throwing in the towel and giving up, he says, God, would you turn your face towards me? Would you look upon me in my situation? Would you give me consideration in this circumstance? Why would we feel like we cannot tell God what's going on? Why we cannot ask God to look at us? We are his sons and his daughters. Yet we will throw up our hands in the air and say, God does not care about me. No, don't do that. Instead, call out to God. The second thing we see David do is ask God, would you answer me? And we can do the same. Ask God to answer you. David says, God, not only do I ask you to look on me, but I ask you to give me an answer for what I'm asking. Sometimes we wonder why we have not received an answer to our prayers. And we have many things to consider, the scripture tells us, concerning an answer prayer. Such as, are we asking selfishly or is what we're asking for really according to God's will? But there's another thing we must ask ourselves. Have we actually asked God to answer? We may respond that we don't have to do that. Why would we have to do that? But listen, sometimes prayer is used to appease the conscience or just so we can tell other people that we've prayed about it, so we can justify it in our own minds, so then we can take matters into our own hands. But prayer is not simply about asking God for something. It's also asking God to answer our request according to his will. This means, listen, this means we have a heart that is truly ready to accept any answer that we receive from the Lord. Number three, the third element in this prayer, ask God to give light to your eyes. He's actually asked God to make his eyes sparkle. I believe there are two concepts that are being illustrated here. First, 
this seems to refer to making David whole again. Instead of being lost in death, David desires for light to be given to his eyes. He wants to be made alive again. He doesn't want to live in the misery that he is in, feeling like he is at the point of death. And second, and I believe even more important, is the idea that David is asking God to allow him to see things the way that God sees them. When, when, when we look at our suffering through our own eyes, it simply doesn't make sense. We do not understand why we're being asked to endure the things that we're going through. And so today we can ask God, God, open my eyes and allow me to see my situation the way you see my situation. God, let me see through your eyes. Let me see with your vision. Let me see with your heart so that I can see you working in the situation, even when I don't think you're working, even when it doesn't feel like you're working. God, I know that you're at work. Let me to see things the way you see things. And then number four, ask God for victory over the enemy. You see, David does not want the enemies in his life to be able to think that they can overcome a servant of the Lord. And David makes this appeal upon the name of the Lord as in the many scriptures have done in the past. The name of the Lord is given reason for scorn if the wicked are able to triumph over the righteous. Therefore, David asked that he overcome his enemies for the Lord's sake. But I want you to hear me, friends. Hear my heart. Remember, our enemies are not flesh and blood. They are the principalities of darkness. There's so much junk going on in our world right now. There's so much hate we see all around us in our culture. And we cannot be deceived into thinking that we are each other's enemies. We have an enemy, Satan, the devil, Lucifer. And let's ask God to give us triumph and victory over him. Let's keep going in verse 5 and 6. But I trust, I love this, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. I know you may be watching, you may be listening right now. And you say, Jason, I would love to have that kind of hope. I would love to have that kind of trust. But you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what I'm experiencing right now. You don't understand the depth of the pain, the profound sadness that I'm feeling. And you're right, I don't. But I'm telling you something, I know that God does. Because the Bible says you have a Savior that has experienced everything you can experience. He can relate to you. He can sympathize. He can empathize with you and what you're going through. And friends, I want to ask you to please trust. Trust that God loves you. You see, he changes gears in these last two verses and describes the hope that he has in God. Despite all of the despair, David still has hope. And God will not let you down when you put your full trust in him. I would encourage you rejoice. Even if you can't rejoice about anything else, believer in Jesus Christ, rejoice that he saved you. You see, the reason that David had hope, the reason he knew that ultimately God had not abandoned him was because of the Lord's salvation. And there is reason to rejoice right now and there is reason to rejoice in the future no matter what we are experiencing because our salvation is secure. We may be going through the pit of despair and the abyss of sorrow, but we know that our salvation is secure and we can rejoice because God says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing. And we worship God. We worship God because of his goodness. David says he will sing to the Lord for he has been good to him. The New King James Version says David will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The bountiful goodness of God, friends, has overflowed towards us. The David had expressed earlier in the psalm that he felt like the Lord's face had been hidden from him. David now recognizes that this is just not the case. God has not left him. God has not abandoned him. 
And friends, he has not left or abandoned you. But maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening, and you know about Jesus, but you don't know him personally. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing him personally. And you can change the channel, or you can turn this video off today, and you can know that you know the Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me encourage you this morning. You and I, we are anyone's. We're anyone's. And it doesn't matter what you've done, what you've said, what you've thought. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you so much that he stepped out of heaven as the God-man, Jesus Christ, and lived the perfect life, fulfilled the law of God that we could not fulfill. And he willingly gave up his life to die on a cross. He spilt his blood so that you could be forgiven of your sin and set free from your sin. But Jesus didn't stay dead. The Bible says he rose from the grave and he is still alive today. And he proved to everyone that he was exactly who he said he was, the son of God in the flesh. And he is at the right hand of the father and he is praying for you because he loves you. He wants to save you. But friends, it starts with believing and trusting in what Jesus did for you on the cross. On the cross, Jesus made salvation available to everyone, but it is only applicable when you receive that free gift of salvation. And I want to give you that opportunity. If you're watching, you say, Jason, that's me. I want to place my faith in Jesus. I invite you to pray this prayer with me today. God, I've been going my own direction with my life. I've been doing my own thing. I've been making my own decisions. And today, I realize I'm a sinner separated from you and I need a savior. And I believe that savior is your son, Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on a cross. I believe he rose again from the grave. And I believe he did it for me. God, I ask you to save me, to change me, to make me brand new. Jesus, you're my Lord. And I'm gonna follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. If that was you, congratulations. It's the greatest decision that you can make with your life. But I want to ask you, please don't change the channel or turn this video off without letting us know the decision that you made. You can go to our website, click the I'm new tab. Just give us a name and email address. Let us know that you prayed to receive Christ or rededicated your life to Christ. We just want to pray for you specifically by name. And we want to send you some resources to help you grow in your faith and become more like Jesus. We believe that Jesus loves you, and so do we. Jesus is for you, and so are we. And we want to help you become everything God has called and created you to be. We love you, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.